are going to talk about vision today. And so we're going to focus on uh, a little bit of the anatomy, go back over that just a little bit for refresher, and then we're going to talk about the neurons for vision, which we call photoreceptors. So if you remember, <coughs> excuse me, there are three layers to the eyeball, and the outermost layer is made up of the white of the eye, which is the sclera, and then the sclera is continuous with the front of the eye, which is the cornea. Now, the cornea is not as thick of a tissue, and it is um, basically translucent so that light can get into, pass through the cornea. But the sclera is much thicker, and we don't want light to be able to get into the eye through the sides of the eye by way of the sclera. And also, once the light enters the eye, we don't want it to be able to escape out of the eye through the sclera. So it has to be a really thick t connected tissue layer to prevent light from either getting in or out. We only want it to come through the cornea. Now once the light comes through this cornea here, it's going to go through this little opening in the iris, this little hole, which is the pupil. And it goes right through the pupil, passes by the lens, and goes through the posterior chamber here, and hits the internal or inner layer of the eye, which is the retina. Now, the retina on the innermost layer is where we have all of our neurons for vision. These, again, are called photoreceptors. And these photoreceptors are made up of basically rods and cones. Now, we're going to go through these in a lot more detail in a little bit. But for the most part, rods are there to help us with night vision. And cones are for the daytime or day vision. Rods also only allow us to see in shades of gray. And cones allow us to see color. So you probably have noticed when the light starts to dim down, you lose the ability to see things in bright colors. And the more dim the light, the more we see things in just these various different shades of gray. And if there's no light at all, then everything is just black. So we need brighter light for us to be able to see the various different colors because we use the cones to do that. So in this inner layer here that's shown in yellow, this is the layer that contains the retina of the eye with all of our photoreceptors. So after the light passes through these photoreceptors, it hits now the middle layer. This middle layer is what we call the choroid layer. The choroid layer is also referred to as the pigmented layer. Okay, so somebody tell me, what is pigment? Color. 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 And that's usually what we think of pigment as. But really, what pigment is, it's a chemical that absorbs light. Okay, so let's talk about light just a little bit, okay, so that we can understand pigment really well. All right, so you know there's different colors of light. Red light, blue light, yellow light, okay, white light, all this kind of different colors of light. You see a rainbow, you see all the different colors. So now I don't know if they ever did this for you like in high school, but if you take like this pyramid looking thing made out of glass, what we call a prism, and you shine just this white light at it, and you have this light hit this prism, okay? What'll happen is what comes out the other side 
are all the different colors of the rainbow. Okay, so the blue, the green, the yellow, the orange, the red. What happens is this white light, what scientists realized is it's all the different colors of the rainbow. So if you take a rainbow and you squish it together and all those colors blend, you get white light. So if you could take white light like you do in a prism and separate it out, you'd get a rainbow. So really what a rainbow is, is it's white light going through all those prisms, which is the rain and the water. That creates a kind of prism, and it separates out the white light into all the colors of the rainbow. So now what pigmented layer does is it can absorb different colors of light. So let's say you're wearing something like a Spider-Man shirt that's blue, okay? And in that shirt, you have a blue pigment. Now, what that blue pigment does, it, uh, it absorbs all the different colors coming from this white light except blue. The blue will hit his shirt, bounce back at you, go into your eye, and your eye perceives the color as blue. So if somebody has uh, a color of a red car, that red car has red pigment all the different colors of the rainbow are hitting that car and being absorbed except red. Red light bounces off of that car, goes into our eye, and we see it as red. Now, black pigment absorbs all light. So when light hits, let's say, a black car, nothing bounces back. And if there's no light hitting your eye, your brain perceives it as black. White, so if you have a white car, a white car has zero pigment in it. It doesn't absorb any light. So if all the colors bounce back at you at the same time, then what happens is your brain perceives that as a white color. So in our eye, our choroid or our pigmented layer is black. So that, again, when the light comes through, through the cornea, through the pupil, through the lens, back through this posterior chamber, hits the retina with the rods and cones, it is then going to hit the pigmented layer and be completely absorbed. Now, if you don't have a pigmented layer, what would happen is that light would then come through and hit the sclera. And since the sclera is white, light would bounce and it might bounce from one side, bounce to the other side, and bounce again, and keep bouncing like a little ping pong ball in the eyeball. And notice, every time it bounces, it, hit, <clears throat> excuse me, it hits that yellow retinal layer and re-stimulates those neurons in our eye. And what we're supposed to get is we're supposed to get the light coming in and just hitting the retina once and sending that picture by way of the optic nerve to our brain. If the light bounces and hits that retina over and over and over again, the brain gets a distorted picture, and it gets very upset and doesn't want you to look at it anymore. So it typically tells you, close your eyes, turn your head away, stop doing this so that you don't keep getting the bouncing. Now, most people have a great pigmented layer. You don't have to worry about that. But what about uh, patients who are albino? And they don't make as much pigment in their body. They have a very difficult time with this. And many of them have to wear sunglasses at all times, so you don't get a lot of bouncing going on in the eyes. And then there are some scientists who believe that some of the problems that people have with, let's say, like dyslexia or maybe learning disabilities, they have difficulty reading and comprehending, it may be because they don't have as good of a pigmented layer in their eye. So the light bounces in their eye a few more times than it should before the light becomes absorbed in the eye. I have a really good friend, we went through college together, and she has very severe dyslexia. It's really awesome because she could write like a whole essay completely backwards. And you can read it by holding it up to a mirror. It's pretty amazing. And uh, her mom put her into uh, a couple very interesting studies. And one of those studies to try to figure out what was going on with the dyslexia, is there any way to help her with this, was a study looking at this pigmented layer. 
And what they did is they gave her different colored like sunglasses to wear while she was reading or writing. And eventually they gave her this kind of red sort of mixed with a little bit of green colored lenses that she put on. And as soon as she put those on, she wrote forward. She stopped writing backward. She was able to write completely forward. And what they believe happened for her is the glasses filtered out the light that actually bounced. And so when she wore those glasses, she could read just fine. She could write just fine. She took those off. She had a very difficult time reading. And she wrote completely backwards. So it's very interesting because you don't actually have to have glasses like that. You could also try getting like sheets of plastic that are various different colors and putting them over the paper like on your book and see if reading through these different colors actually allows for better comprehension. Especially if you or maybe you know somebody who they're reading because your paper's white. So you're getting a lot of light coming into the eye, okay? And when they're reading, does this happen? You know, they start reading along and they're doing okay at first. Maybe they even get a couple paragraphs, but maybe by the third or fourth paragraph, the words are sort of blurry. You're not really sure what you're reading anymore. And by the fifth paragraph, you're just like, oh, oh okay, I, I gotta stop. I, I can't do this. Because you've completely lost track. You don't know where you're at. You can't remember a word you just read. And that could be because there's too much bouncing of the light in the eye. And so putting various colors over top of the paper may help that person with reading comprehension and being able to read for a lot longer. I have a daughter who has dyslexia and uh, she puts uh, a blue over top of her books and when she does she's able to read extremely well. So, just kind of interesting. Is that all for people that are colorblind? They have those glasses where they put them on and they can see? No, like that's very different. That's actually filtering light a different way so that other cones are able to help them to see color. Like for instance, okay, so we have certain types of cones. We have cones that can see blue light. We have cones that can see red light. We have cones that can see green light. And we have cones that can see yellow light. Now what are those colors? Primary. Those are primary colors, exactly. So if I want to see something that's purple, I'm getting red light and blue light coming in, and my red cones and blue cones are firing at the same time, and my brain interprets that as purple. So I have the right cones to give me all the different mixtures of colors that we can see in the world. But people who are colorblind, okay, so if you remember, we've got chromosome number 23, that if you're female, they kind of sort of look like this, like two X's. If you're male, they're actually two X's, okay, but it's actually missing a tail. So it's missing one side of the X, so we call it an X and a Y. But really, truly, it's actually two X's, but one part of the X is gone. Now, the genetic information, the genes we use to build cones are found on this area of the X that's gone. So for the male, he's got it here only. For the female, she has the information here on both of her chromosomes, okay? So what happens mostly, color blindness is seen mainly in men because it's much easier to have color blindness if he's missing part of this information, okay? So part of it is gone. So maybe he doesn't have the information, the genes on how to build blue cones so he can't see blue light probably has a difficult time with purple also, or different things that greens maybe a little bit, but the, it would be like a greenish turquoise blue he'd have a problem with. Uh, if he doesn't have red cones, he can't see red light. Now what he sees instead is shades of gray. The rods will take over and look at that. Uh, Brendan, you probably heard us talking the other day. One of the lab people came in and asked me what color this cutting board was, and I'm like, uh, powdered blue. And she's like, okay, I just wanted to make sure we both saw it the same color because one of our other lab technicians in the back is a male and he thought they were gray. Now, he's in his 40s and had absolutely no idea he had colorblindness problems. So we did a little colorblindness test on him and sure enough, he can't see blue. 
All his life, he thought blue was a gray color, which is very interesting. It's much more difficult for females to have color blindness because they have the two X's. Now, for some females, uh, they may be missing some of it on one X, but the other X can help to take over. So maybe they can't see shades of red quite as well. They can't distinguish the various different shades. I have that problem. I can see red, especially like bright red, but if you give me a couple different really close shades, I'm like, mm, no, I can't tell the difference between those two. And uh, I didn't know that until we started doing a lab in here where people were coming up to me and telling me, can you tell the difference between these shades? And I had a, a lab assistant at the time, and she's like, Dr. Harvey, you're getting those all wrong. Really? Okay, so then we went back and did a colorblind test on me, and sure enough, I just don't see reds very well. I have a very difficult time. So uh, we're going to today, in lab, do a colorblind test on all of you to see how you do in all of your rods and cones and see what you have. should be very interesting. So that's how this works. So you might have somebody who's red and green colorblind. That means they don't have any red or green cones at all. Or maybe, okay, so ladies, you've probably asked some guy in your life, hey, what color is this? And he says, pink, and you go, no, it's salmon. Okay, uh, first of all, don't ask men what color anything is. Call your girlfriend or your mama. Leave them alone. Because remember, they're missing some cone capability here. So men typically, not always, but typically don't have as many cones as women. So men also, kind of like me, usually don't see certain shades of particular colors. Now, that doesn't happen in all men. Some men really do very, very well, but there are some men who cannot see shades very well. So you just need to give them a break there. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so you also remember in anatomy, uh, your teachers talk to you about anterior chambers and posterior <laughs> chambers, okay? So this is the anterior chamber that sits before the lens. Behind the lens is the posterior chamber. So in the anterior chamber, we make a fluid called aque oops, that's a G. aqueous humor. And the interesting thing about this fluid is that we make about, oh, give or take, a quarter of a teaspoon, maybe about two or three drops of aqueous humor every single day. And this aqueous humor is full of all kinds of nutrients and helps to keep the lens really nice and happy and alive. Uh, and then every day there's this little teeny tiny microscopic hole. You can't see it with the naked eye. The aqueous humor, two or three drops, drain out of that little hole every single day into the bloodstream. <coughs> now, the uh, little hole nowadays, they call it the scleral venous sinus. I like the old name better. It used to be called the canal of Schlem. That's just a cool name, Schlem. Uh, anyway, you don't have to memorize that at all. I just want you to know that it drains out a little bit every day. Now, unfortunately for some people, that little canal of Schlem clogs up. But this is like the slowest clogging microscopic canal ever because sometimes it will take up to 20 years to completely clog that little tiny canal. So that people don't ever really know it's happening because it goes so friggin' slow. Now let's go back to this other picture here for a second. So if the aqueous humor starts building up over a 20-year period, sometimes, but almost never, do we see the front of the eyeball protruding out. Instead, what typically happens is the excess fluid in the front starts to push towards the back of the eye. And as it pushes, there's a fluid in the back of the eye, we'll talk about this in a second, called the vitreous humor. It starts pushing on the retina, on the rods and cones, which then gets squished up against the hard sclera of the eye. So basically, you're sandwiching your photoreceptors between this vitreous humor and the sclera, and you're slowly squishing them over time. So that 15, 20 years later, your patient wakes up going, I can't hardly see anything. Those people out there just look like 
black trees walking around, maybe in the shadows, and they're losing their vision really, really bad. Now, sometimes this can be painful, which would be a plus for the person because then they'll go in and see the doctor faster, but most of the time they don't feel anything. And this disease is what is referred to as glaucoma. So how we test for this glaucoma, uh, really one of the older fashioned tests that they used to do, they shouldn't be doing this as much anymore, is if you've ever gone to the eye doctor, they do that puff of air into your eye, uh, you know, and it makes you a blink and all. What they're doing is they're shooting that air at a certain pressure, and then they're measuring how much pressure it bounces back at. If it bounces back at too much pressure, that means there's too much pressure in your eye, too much aqueous humor. Now, even better, what they'll do is they'll numb your eye, and then they take like this little gauge, almost like a little tire gauge, and they touch the surface of your eye. You can't feel it because the eye's numb. They touch the surface of your eye in multiple places, and they can measure the pressure much more accurately of the eyeball to make sure that aqueous humor isn't building up. And unfortunately, this seems to run in families. So if you have, you know, aunts, grandparents, whatever, who have had glaucoma, there's a higher probability that you are at risk for this too. So even if you don't wear glasses, you should be going in at least once a year just to have like the glaucoma test and things like that. I hate to tell you this, but you all are old enough to start doing it. Okay? You're already aging. How unfortunate. <laughs> now, in the back of the eye is what we have called the vitreous humor. So this is in the posterior chamber. Unlike the aqueous humor, we don't continue to make this throughout our life. The vitreous humor is made in the fetal stage of development, and that's it. You don't make any more. So the vitreous humor has a couple really important jobs. One is it helps to keep the shape of the eye. Now, by the way, since we don't make any more vitreous humor throughout our lifetime, when you're born, you're born with adult size eyes. So I always kind of get a kick out of people going, oh, your baby has such big eyes. It's like, no kidding. Yeah, that's as big as they're ever going to get, folks, okay? They don't grow. So that's why they got those big old eyes, okay? So the vitreous humor helps to keep the shape of the eyeball, but even more important, really, all those photoreceptors, that retina, they don't stick to the walls of the eye. What happens is the vitreous humor actually creates a pressure and holds those photoreceptors up onto the wall of the eye. Now, this is never a problem for anybody unless you are in like maybe a car accident or maybe you're a boxer or somebody like that, and the head snaps really fast to one side or the other. Because what could happen is the vitreous humor moves away from the wall of the eye, even just for a split second. And then the retina falls. It will just sort of bunch up. Now, you might have seen this, okay, in anatomy. Uh, did you get to cut open a cow's eye? Yeah. Okay. So when you cut open that cow's eye and you opened it up, you remember how it was sort of blue, black, shiny inside? Mm -hmm. That's not the retina. That was the choroid, or the pigmented layer. When you opened it up, you pulled out that snotty stuff, the vitreous humor, right? Okay? And at the bottom of your eye, hopefully your anatomy teacher pointed it out, the retina fell. It was sort of that brownish, liquidy stuff that was at the bottom of the eye. Because once you pulled the vitreous humor out, there was nothing to hold the retina up onto the walls of the eye. If while the person is alive, that vitreous humor moves and the retina kind of slides off the wall, sort of bunches up, this is what we call a detached retina. Now it's real easy to fix. What will happen is the person will get like a blind spot in their vision. They'll know that there's a problem. And then to fix it, all they'll do is go in like with a little laser, cut open the sclera of the eye, put in like a little camera with a little sort of paintbrush, and they'll take some tweezers, pull the vitreous humor back, and use this little teeny tiny paintbrush to paint the retina back up onto the wall of the eye, and then push the vitreous humor back up onto it. You don't have to have any stitches or anything because the sclera is real sticky, and once you cut it open, it just sort of sucks in on itself, and it'll repair itself very, very quickly. So they get that retina pushed back up, and the vitreous humor holding it right there. Only problem is they're much more susceptible for that coming 
detached again. So like if they're a boxer, uh, they have to stop because they could get that detached retina over and over again. So they have to stop what they're doing. And that has happened to actually quite a few professional boxers. Okay, so one other thing I want to show you in this picture is the lens of the eye. Now, notice this picture, they've cut the lens in half so that you can see it's actually made up of many, many layers. Notice the innermost layer here. It's the smallest area. That's pretty much what we're born with. We're born with a really teeny tiny lens. And as we age, it's kind of like the rings of a tree, okay? Over the years, we get more rings to our lens. Now, that lens needs to be very pliable. It has to be able to stretch, okay? So notice here, there's some muscles here with some ligaments attached to the lens, and that would be the same above, even though you can't see it in this picture. And those ligaments and muscles can pull on our lens and basically elongate it or stretch it out. Now, our lens in our eye is just like the lens of a camera. What's the lens of a camera do for us? Focus, exactly. Our lens helps us to focus. So if you're looking at something further away or you're looking at something close up, you're going to need different focus, okay? So the lens changes shape to help us to focus. Now, if we're looking at something close up, we're going to stretch the lens so that it becomes real long and skinny. If we're looking at something far away, we just relax the lens so that it balls up into like a circle. This is also why when you're reading a lot, your eyes start to get a little sore. And you know, you feel a little pressure in there because you're making those muscles pull that lens constantly to keep it real long and skinny so you can see things close up. So really, if you don't want to you know, have that soreness in your eyes, you should only be reading for maybe about 30 minutes and then just kind of stop. Don't do any reading, sort of just look away into the distance and let your lens and all those muscles relax. Now sometimes people will read so much that they end up needing reading glasses, okay? It's not because they actually have any problem with their eyes, it's that their muscles are just so fatigued that you put the glasses on them so that the muscles don't have to change the shape of the lens. The lens just stays all rounded up. So you can avoid having to wear those reading glasses as much when you're younger uh, if you just give yourself a little bit of a break. You know, about every 30 minutes, just stop reading for maybe about 10 minutes and then come back to it. You won't get all those headaches or the soreness in your eyes. Now, as you get older, we continue to put more layers on the lens. And there's two problems with this. One, light's got to be able to go through this lens to the back of the eye. So it has to be pretty transparent. But if you put too many layers on the lens, it becomes so thick, light can't actually get through. That's a problem. If you cannot get light through this lens because there's too much thickness to the lens, this is what we call a cataract. Now, how you get thicker lenses? Eat too many carbohydrates, give yourself some diabetes, cataracts are going to be inevitable. Another way, expose your eyes to a lot of ultraviolet light, like living in the high desert and not wearing sunglasses. You're going to get cataracts. So your best bet is don't eat as many carbs, wear those sunglasses, decrease your risk of cataracts. But if somebody does get them, nowadays it's fairly easy to fix this. Uh, they can make artificial lenses in the laboratory. And so what the doctor is going to do if your patient has cataracts is they're going to take a laser and go around the cornea of the eye and pop the cornea off. Real simple to do. Your patient is even awake while they do this. And you can't feel anything. They give you tons of Valium. You're a happy, happy camper. I've watched a few cataract surgeries. And these people are smiling and they're happy. They're feeling really good. So they pop the uh, cornea off, just kind of slide it to the side. They don't take it off the eye. And then they just go in with tweezers 
and they'll cut the lens pretty much into uh, quarters and then pull each of those out. Or sometimes, some doctors, they just take a little machine that pulverizes the lens and then your eye will just uh, phagocytize all the pieces out. So it just sort of depends on the doctor. And then they'll just take the artificial lens and pop it in. And these little ligaments here, the suspensory ligaments, they're very, very sticky and they will just suck right onto that lens and they begin working right away. And then you just take that cornea, slide it right on back, and again, that's very sticky too, and it will hold. Now all they tell you is, well, for the next week, don't pick up anything heavy, don't bend over, we don't you, want you to build up pressure and pop that cornea off. Let it have a little bit of time to see and stick a little bit more. And that's it, it's a very, very fast surgery, it takes about maybe 15 minutes. It takes you like five hours to check in and 15 minutes for the surgery, okay? And then you go home and just have to wear some sunglasses for a couple days and you're good to go. And you have really nice vision again. So cataract surgery is really, really easy to do, but if you can save your own lenses, you know, best to wear those sunglasses and try not to eat too many of those sugars. So you really want that stretchiness. Now, another problem. You may not get excessive amounts of layers so that light can't shine through, but as we get older, doesn't matter who you are, you're still going to put more layers on that lens. So it becomes a little less flexible, a little less stretchy. So that as you get a bit older, you're going to notice that as you're reading things, you can't stretch the lens out as much to focus as close. And so what you're reading starts to go a little bit further away until your arm isn't long enough anymore and you go and buy yourself some reading glasses. And you have what we now refer to as presbyopia, which just means your book says old lenses. I like to call them mature lenses myself, but it just happens when you're layers become too thick for flexibility and it's going to happen to everybody so just get yourself a cute pair of those and you'll just look awesome. Uh, if you wear like regular eyeglasses that uh, doesn't really correct that? No. Mm -hmm. That's when you'll have to get like the bifocals. Uh -huh. That will that will be what happens. Oh okay. Yeah. And they have awesome ones nowadays so you don't even have to worry about there's no line there or anything. Nobody will ever know. I went into an optometrist. This was like maybe about four years ago. And uh, went and had my eyes checked and everything. I, I had um, a surgery on my eyes, the LASIK surgery, many, many, many years ago. And uh, I recommend it for anybody. It just was very wonderful because I... You know, we'll do a, a test for your vision today. And my eyes were so bad, I couldn't like even see the big E. Okay, they were just like, okay, almost blind. Had the surgery done, very, very simple surgery, really easy. Kind of funky though, because you're still awake when it's done, and you can smell your eyes burning as they use that laser. And what they're doing is they're taking your cornea, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, and they're resurfacing your cornea so that your vision is better, and I'll show you why after we come back from a break. Uh, and then what they do is they take like little ice cubes and put it on your eye, because the laser makes your eyes hot, and you can hear your eyes going sizzling. Mm -hmm. So a little freaky, but it was well worth it. So the muscles of the iris are going to control pupil size to allow more or less light in, depending on what you need. And those muscles are controlled by the autonomic nervous system, both parasympathetic and sympathetic. So the sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight, our stressed out portion of the nervous system. And so what that does for us is it causes the pupils to dilate and allows a whole bunch of light to come into the eye so you can get away from that lion that's chasing you. Or the parasympathetic, which is resting and digesting, will cause the <coughs> muscles to constrict down on the pupil and make the pupil much smaller so not as much light can get in and so that you can sleep better. Alright, so let's talk a little bit about <coughs> the eye itself and how it works. The shape of the eye has a lot to do 
with also how we're able to perceive different things in our vision and where the light falls on the retina of the eye in particular. So if you're looking at a person's eyeball, you have the cornea of the eye, which is that translucent connective tissue. And then we also have the lens of the eye. And at the back of the eye, where the retina is located, there is a region here which is called the fovea centralis, where all we have are cones. There are no rods in this region. And this is a region where we will have the clearest, most crisp vision that our brain is able to perceive. So all of this region is nothing but cones. Now, as you go away from this region on either side of the eye, we actually have less and less cones, more and more rods. Now, when I'm looking at an object, okay, due to the shape of the cornea and the shape of the lens, I'm able to get this object to the fovea centralis. So what I mean by that is, you know, you're sitting here in this classroom and you can see a whole lot of stuff, even if you're just looking forward. And imagine this whole big picture that you see has to be funneled into your eyeball and then into this little teeny tiny spot at the back of your eyeball. And so the cornea and the lens are going to help with this funneling and directing of this picture of this light to the fovea centralis of the eye. So if you look at the shape of the cornea, for instance, okay, it has this shape here, this kind of curved shape. And when light travels, it always travels in waves. And if the light hits directly at the center of this curvature, it's basically flat right here at the center. And so light will go through straight. But if the light hits on the curve, what this curve does is it will bend the light inward. So if it hits on the curve here, it will bend the light inward. So both our cornea and our lens have this kind of curvature. So again, if it goes straight on in, it will go straight through to the fovea centralis. If we hit on either end, it will bend <coughs> inward so that whatever we see at the top actually bends in such a way that at the back of the eye, we flipped it upside down and made it a lot smaller so that it fits on the fovea centralis. Now, this type of curvature is called a convex curvature or a convex lens. If we had a curvature like this, this would be concave, so that if light hits in the center here again, it just goes straight on through because it's flat. But if the light hits at the curve here, it will actually hit and bounce outward. Now, we really don't have much of that to be concerned about unless a person has astigmatism. So if an individual has astigmatism, and again, today in lab, we're going to test to see if you've got that as well, what we see is that this cornea and or the surface of the lens is not smooth. People with astigmatism, their corneas have a tendency to be more like this, where they've got these little pits in their cornea, or maybe the same thing in their lens, so that when light hits this pit, instead of curving in, it curves up. If it hits over here, it curves in. If it hits here, it curves out so that they don't get a smooth picture going to the fovea centralis, the light waves are going in the wrong direction and they get this blurry, unusual picture. 
and this is what astigmatism is, unusual curvature of the lens and or of the cornea. And again, this can be fixed with a laser. It can smooth the surface of the cornea and you can get rid of astigmatism problems that way. <coughs> so this is what we're seeing in the picture here. Here's the R at one end and then you can see how it's flipped upside down and it's much smaller. Now eventually this information will follow through the optic nerve to the occipital lobe of the brain. And what the occipital lobe of the brain, the vision center, does is it will flip that picture right side up and tell us how big it's supposed to be so that we see it appropriately. Now, one other thing, the occipital lobe of the brain, uh, you can have patients who their eyes are working just fine, but maybe they've been in a car crash or they've had some kind of uh, disease, maybe meningitis or something, and they've had problems with their occipital lobe. Or maybe it's the other way. Uh, maybe their eyes aren't working so fine, but the occipital lobe is, and now they have vision problems. Uh, I watched a patient one time who, he had been in a car accident, and his eyes were just fine, but his occipital lobe wasn't working like it was supposed to. And what they did is they brought him into this room, and they sat him down at a table like this. He's completely blind, and we were watching through a camera, and uh, there was one little light in there, and you could see somebody coming in, and they brought a blue pitcher of water and a glass and set it next to him. And then they asked him, so do you see anything? Nope, it's black and blind, okay? He was a real smart person. Um, and uh, so then they turned the light off, and of course you couldn't see anything. And what they had done is they had implanted electrodes into his brain to help to stimulate that occipital lobe. So they flipped the switch and turned the electrodes on, and then they flipped the light on. And he's like, oh my gosh, I can see. And I'm like, okay, please describe for us what you see. And he described the blue pitcher, he described the glass. They asked him, please pick up the pitcher and pour water into the glass. He did it perfectly, and then they flipped the switch off. And you could see his face just kind of fall, because now he can't see again. And uh, they turned off the light, they took the pitcher and the glass out. This time, they brought in a candle and a box of matches. They flipped the switch back on to his occipital lobe, turned the light back on, and said, okay, what can you see now? He described the candle and the matches. They asked him to take the matches, light the candle. He was able to do that. They asked him to blow the candle out. He was able to do that. They turned the switch off, and he couldn't see again. So for these patients, they're trying to figure out an implant. Now here's the problem. What do you do when you go to sleep at night? Because for us, in our brain, we actually have an area in our brain stems called the reticular activating center, and that center controls how fast or slow the brain processes. So basically at nighttime when we want to go to sleep, that particular activating center slows down your brain, turns off your recognition of sight, allows you and I to be able to go to sleep. Well with these people, you turn on the occipital lobe and it's being artificially stimulated and the reticular activating center isn't doing this. And so when we wake up in the morning, reticular activating center is waking our brain up, allowing us to perceive vision again, letting us know it's time to get up and everything's working okay. So they're trying to figure out how do you flip the switch? Do you actually put a switch for the patient to turn on and off? Is that okay to do? Uh, how do you control that so they have the ability to sleep? It's a big question. And so they been working with a lot of different patients to see how they can uh, be able to visualize while still being able to sleep at night. <clears throat> now, this is a normal shaped eye and you can see the cornea and the lens are bending the light to go to the fovea centralis in the back. Now, although our eyes don't grow any larger throughout our lifetime, they can change shape. And this has a lot to do with genetics. And some people, oops, sorry about that. Some people, their eyes will, why did I do that? It's going crazy. Some people, their eyes will elongate. It'll get longer. 
And so notice the way that the cornea and the lens bends the light, it should be hitting the fovea centralis, but the eyeball is longer, so that by the time the light gets to the eyeball back here, uh, instead of being pinpoint, it has spread out, it's fanned out, and our brain doesn't get a clear picture. This is called a myopic eye, and this person would be nearsighted. That means they can read things close up, but they don't have good far away vision. On the other hand, some people, their eyes will shorten, and again, the bending of the light isn't enough. When it hits the fovea centralis, it's not pinpoint. It's still too spread out, so they get unclear vision. <coughs> and this is called a hyperopic eye, and they are farsighted. And so that means they can see farther away, but they can't read close. By putting different shaped lenses in front of their eye now, like in glasses or contacts, you're able to bend the light so that it hits the fovea centralis appropriately and they get a clear picture. If they have LASIK surgery, what will happen is they'll go in and reshape the cornea so that the cornea now bends the light differently and you get the pinpoint clear picture on the fovea centralis. Only thing is, once you've had this LASIK surgery, you can never wear contacts again because your cornea is not an appropriate shape for contacts to fit any longer because they all come in basic sizes and your uh, cornea would be kind of off size. And so if you didn't have, if, it, if your eyes went bad and you needed to do something, you'd have to have either another surgery or you just have to wear glasses. You can't wear the contacts anymore. Couple terms, convergence. This is where your eye muscles are able to pull your eyes. And we're going to do a little test in lab where you're going to take uh, like a pencil or pen that has writing on it. And you're going to hold it at arm's length and stare at the letters. And then what you're going to do is slowly bring the pencil in while you're staring at the letters. And if they go blurry, stop, refocus, maybe blink a couple of times and then keep bringing them in until you get to a point where you can't refocus. What's happening as you're bringing this in, your muscles of your eye are causing the eyes to go in, pointed to your nose, you're kind of going cross-eyed there, and this is convergence. So how well can you continue to refocus? This also has a lot to do with how stretchy your lens is. Okay, so how well do the eyes converge. Now you'll have some patients where if you watch them do this, you can see that they've got weak muscles on one side or the other because their eyes will come in just for a time, but then one eye will wander. And they may not even know that they have this eye that wanders because they've got weak muscles that can't keep the eye in. And this is a really serious problem for them to be able to read, okay, because they're not aware because they can't see their eyes. They think their eyes are converging on the paper, but one eye is wandering over to the side. Real simple to fix that. They just have to strengthen those muscles. And there's certain uh, exercises that the patient can do to get those muscles really, really strong. Another term, accommodation. We've already talked about this, but this is the ability of the lens to change shape so we can focus. So this is accommodation. And remember, presbyopia is where the lens hardens over time because you put so many layers on it so they don't have good accommodation or they don't have good focus. 